Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number 51 of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Today, I'm speaking with Terry McIntosh, who enlisted in the U.S. Army at age 17 and joined Special Forces at age 18 to become one of the youngest men ever to wear the Green Beret. He served on an A-team in Vietnam in 1968 and was present during one of the most infamous events of the war when a Vietnamese double agent was identified and subsequently killed by the Special Forces team he had been working with. That incident is now known as the Green Beret Affair. I invited Terry on the podcast after reading his article on the subject titled The Green Beret Affair, A Factual Review, and his book on the subject, The Youngest Green Beret. But before we get into this discussion, I want to ask you a question. Do you ever look around and wonder if anyone is listening in? If you're subscribed to this podcast, then the answer is probably yes. But how do you protect yourself from being overheard when that's the last thing that you want? How do you keep your conversations between you and the person in front of you and no one else? The answer is the ultrasonic speech protection jammers from tinytransmitters.com. When switched on, these jammers can effectively disable any microphones nearby. Likewise, if you're a part of an agency or organization with unique needs, you can trust tiny transmitters to meet those needs with customized solutions designed to your specifications. Tiny transmitters can embed the newest ultra small transmitters in devices such as power strips, key fobs, cigarette packs, picture frames, and even in the walls of a cardboard box almost anything you can imagine, and probably a lot of things you haven't until now. Every order from Tiny Transmitters ships free anywhere in the U.S. or Canada. What's more, you can now use the discount code SPYCRAFT101 to get 20% off your order. Go check it out now at tinytransmitters.com. That's tinytxs.com. Terry, I really appreciate you sitting down for this interview today. I've been wanting to learn more about this subject from you for a long time now. Well, thanks for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be here. <laughs> Terrific. Terrific. So I want to go back to the beginning of your story, which, of course, is always the best place to start. But you're called the youngest Green Beret for a reason. So as I understand it, you dropped out of high school and enlisted in the Army. It was at 17. You dropped out at 16 and enlisted at 17. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. You know, I had quit high school at the age of 16, joined the Army at 17. And it's thought that I'm the youngest Green Beret to have served on a Special Forces A team and to have earned the uh, combat badge. That's amazing. That's amazing. And this is at a time when a lot of people were doing everything they could to avoid getting drafted into the military and certainly not even considering volunteering. So what was it that led you to want to volunteer and serve overseas in, in Vietnam when so many people were trying to avoid that altogether? Well, there were a couple of things going on at the same time, that being the war, of course, and American boys were being killed. I didn't know anything about Vietnam, but the patriotic edge in me felt like that I should be doing something to assist the cause. I was 17 years old and with no real direction in life, so I, I really needed a place to land anyway. So it just worked out that it was to my benefit which it did turn out to be for my benefit. Yeah, it seems like it really shaped you from what I can tell from your book. And I'm sure we'll get into that in a few minutes, but it seemed like, a, I mean, you went through quite a trial by fire there, but you came out like a, a very different man, is my impression from reading your book. That's true. The, the Army overall was very good for me because as a teenager, I was very undisciplined, self-willed, you know, with no purpose or direction. And the Army replaced all of that with, with purpose and dedication. That's fantastic. I know it's done that for a lot of people, certainly. But before you went to Vietnam, initially you were serving overseas in Germany, right? Right. Immediately after I had finished jump school and earned my paratrooper wings, I was assigned to the 17th Infantry Long Range Recon Unit in Frankfurt, Germany. That's where I took my initial LRP training and prepared for you know, future assignment to, to Nam. Hmm. So on, on this podcast, you know, I've, I've talked many times about the Cold War and Cold War Germany, but never from the perspective of someone that was in a line unit like you were at that time. So were you 
training and preparing for, you know, Soviet tanks to roll into Germany or a nuclear exchange? Or was it mostly like getting prepared for everybody to eventually rotate into Vietnam? Well, that's how it turned out. Yes, now, we were prepared, you know, to defend Germany against a communist invasion. That was part of it. We trained with the German army and, and other foreign armies that were in the area, you know, for that purpose, but it was also oriented towards Vietnam. So we were prepared either way. Okay. Did that training in that time in Germany, I mean, long range reconnaissance patrol, that sounds like, you know, a hallmark of, of Vietnam from my outsider perspective. So do you feel like you were well prepared when you went from Germany to Vietnam or was it like a, like a culture shock taking a completely out of a different situation into something brand new for you? Well, Justin, actually it prepared me very well for it. I know that there were a lot of young men who were drafted directly out of high school, sent to basic training and AIT for a few weeks, and they landed in Vietnam emotionally unprepared for it. It was unfortunate for them. But in my case, I was well-trained and skilled. I was prepared for it. The training that we went through was very extensive. Whenever I encountered my first combat experience, it was just like training, except that Instead of blanks, it was real bullets. Wow. But it seemed pretty normal. Wow, that, that's actually a ringing endorsement for the people that trained you in that case. It, it Actually, they did an excellent job, and I'm, I'm thankful to them. And I'm still in touch with one of those sergeants today. Oh, wow, that's fantastic. So as you mentioned earlier, and as I mentioned earlier as well, you're called the youngest Green Beret for a reason. And can you explain your, your path into special forces and to the beret was a little bit unique. Can you, so can you clarify that for people who are listening? Sure. And it's unlikely this can ever happen again because of new standards, but you have to remember the context of things back in 1968 and with the Vietnam war going on and there was a shortage of personnel to fill critical positions that special forces needed to fill. The average age of a special forces soldier was 30 to 35 years. The minimum age requirement was 20 years old, but because of the, the need that they had, they reduced the minimum age limit to 18 in search of qualified soldiers. And my training and the, uh, the overall experiences that I had seemed to satisfy special forces. I did volunteer for Vietnam because that's why I went in the army in the first place, you know, was to contribute to the cause. But I didn't volunteer for special forces. I just volunteered for Vietnam. I just assumed that I would be assigned to a paratrooper unit, you know, like the 101st Airborne or, 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 or another unit. But orders came down for special forces. And that's because they were looking for people who were qualified and I fit their qualifications. So although it was a volunteer unit, I was actually, you could say, drafted by them, <laughs> which is quite an honor, especially at that age. Maybe I could have even refused it. I don't know. But of course, I was proud to to have been selected. So I, I didn't. Hmm. Do you happen to know how you were selected? I mean, was it specifically because of your LERP training or were you just getting off the plane at the right time, so to speak? Well, yeah, it was because of the training, which was very extensive. But I, I was also certified and qualified in three different military skills which is a requirement of the Special Forces to be multi-skilled. Mm -hmm. The communications skill was one of those. And that, I believe, was a primary reason that I was looked at extensively because they needed that to be filled. Right, right. Okay, okay. That makes perfect sense. Yeah, they had a vacancy and you could fill it perfectly. Okay, so for that reason, so you served with the team, but you didn't actually go through like the qualification course or, or the pipeline back in the United States or anything like that typically. Is that right? No, I did not do that. That is called the Q course, which today, in order to serve on an A team, you have to be Q qualified. That was not the case back in 1968. And of course, remembering it was a time of war and a shortage of personnel. And so there were allowances made. But there is a TDY, which is temporary duty assignment to a unit. And you aren't a member of that unit. You are simply assigned to assist that unit. Then there's the PCS, which is a permanent change of station, which embeds you into the unit. You are part of that unit. And so I was PCS. They chose me and embedded me into the unit and issued me the full flash green beret, oh, okay. which 
at, at the time was standard recognition. The uh, Special Forces tab didn't exist until 1988, I think, or somewhere mm. like that. So the Green Beret itself, full flash, was recognition of, of inclusion. So they issued that to me, and I was as much a part of them as anyone else at that time. Yeah, I mean, if you're, as we'll talk about, certainly, you know, if you're if you're running the missions and you're at the same level of danger and you're filling a, a critical billet there, then certainly you're a part of the team in every way that is that matters. Yeah, well, they felt that way. Yeah. Good. So once you've been selected for this team, you mentioned your communications, especially. What was your mission once you actually got into country? Were you put on this team like on day one, so to speak, or did you do anything else before that? Well, no. Initially, when I arrived in in the train, my first stop, I went through a brief course of you know Vietnam warfare, special forces style, and which was pretty much standard for everybody. But I also went through another communications course, communications course in learning how to operate uh, special SF radios and, and that sort of thing. So altogether, it was about, a, I was there about a month before they sent me out from there. Okay. And where did you go after you finished this training? To Kanto, which was a large military base that hosted, you know, several different army groups and, and an airfield. And I worked there as a communications specialist, receiving and decoding intel reports from the A-teams. Okay. I see. Is this the place that was really close to the Cambodian border or was that later on? No, no. That's, this is, I'm guess, guessing now, maybe 50, 60 miles from the border okay. there. Okay. So that was, it was still a, you know, potentially dangerous place to be, but uh, it wasn't on the border. No. Okay, I see. And at what point did you end up working really close to the border, like you've described in your in your writings? Well, from Kanto with the C team, I was assigned to B Team Forty One in Makwa, which was fairly close to the to the border. And I served there in the same capacity. It branched out. My experience began to branch out from the B team. I volunteered to serve on the River Patrol Unit, which was you know, running the rivers and the, the, the various canals to inspect for enemy weapons being smuggled and and just keeping the area safe from Viet Cong infiltration. I served on that position as well as working in the communications room at the same time. I'd get about five or six hours sleep in between the two jobs. Oh, wow. It kept you busy then. Yeah, yeah. But it was good to be busy. And it was my getting out with the people. That was my first experience with them, you know, to really meet the Vietnamese people, to understand what they were going through. So, yeah, that's where it started. Hmm. And from there, that's where I also had my first combat experience from while well, I was on the B team. And immediately after that, I was assigned to the A team, which sat about three miles from the border. Spent a lot of time at the forward observation base, which was, you know, 1,600 feet from the Cambodian border. Wow. Our mission there was, of course, the area of operation that we were assigned was, you know, to obtain security for that area, to eliminate any Viet Cong activity. Yeah, that must have been incredibly hairy. I, I can only imagine. I mean, I've, I've read and heard a lot about what, how difficult the situation at the border was. Was it, in your opinion at that time, was it a highly, like a politically charged issue or was it just more of like a, a tactical issue with they had a, you know, like a, a terrain feature that prevented you from from pursuing them, for example, with the, at the border? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it was political. You know, we were prohibited from entering into Cambodia politically for political reasons. Yet the Viet Cong and the NVA, the North Vietnamese Army, were using Cambodia as a buildup. Along the border where we were camped, we were in an area which is called the Finger, which that was part of our AO. It was, it's called the Finger because, you know, it was Cambodia on each side with a point leading into Cambodia. Ah, okay. And the Viet Cong were, they had about a thousand troops stationed on that border right there at us. And 15 miles according to all of our intelligence, 15 miles to our north, there was a continued buildup of, of approximately 40 to 50,000 enemy troops. Wow. So yeah, it was highly potentially dangerous. Yeah. Wow, wow. So you're, you're fairly close to 50,000 enemy troops 
and you're just in your, your fob, which I assume is pretty darn small. And what, was there a concern like at any moment they could sweep down here and, and, and wipe us out or was, was the yes. political situation keeping them away as well? No, I don't think it was the political situation. I think it had to do because of spy connections that they had within the area. Ah, okay. And they didn't want to disrupt any of that. You know, I, I often said at the FOB staring in the, in the Cambodia thinking, my gosh, you know, <laughs> what's keeping those guys from just running over us here? But I, I don't know for sure, but I would think that their connections had something to do with that because I know you'll get into it in a moment, but but after the double agent was executed, activity against us increased. Oh, okay, I can imagine. Were, were they so close at the time? I'm trying to visualize the border here. Could you could you just see them across the border, like with binos or something like that? Or was it still, were they still like very low profile and hidden for the most part? Well, they were very low profile, except that at nighttime, you know, sometimes you could see the lights that would be moving and things like that. Okay. And, and some vehicles you could detect, yeah. I've got it, I've got it. So. With all those troops, Master, how, how frequently were you in contact? Like, I mean, I know that you went out on some patrols. You described that a little bit. Were you shot at pretty frequently, or did the base take the indirect fire very often? Well, uh, initially, until later, and um, when I first arrived, contact was infrequent. We just had some skirmishes. But the enemy had been attacking Makwa, well, as, as long as 52 nights in a row before I even came to the team. Wow. And so once I had been assigned to the A team, it had pretty much been decided that they were, you know, coming from our area of operation, but nobody could really locate the them. So, you know, our ambush patrols were set up in an effort to stop them. And we would occasionally have a skirmish with someone coming through the area, but it never was anything big. Okay, I see. So at the same time, at your FOB, were, were the detachment B-57 guys there at the FOB with you at this time? Well, no. The uh, B-57 attachment was assigned to our team as a covert operation. Our team was assigned to assist them. We, we provided housing and, and a place for them to operate from. And we were not directly a part of the project, but we were there to assist them on an as-needed basis. Okay. And this was just, I mean, can you describe the team? I think it was just three people. Is that correct? That's right. There were three, three soldiers. There was Captain Robert Morasco, who at the time, I didn't know his real name. His alias was Robert Martin. He had a an operator assigned to him and a case manager that we called Mike. So the three of them represented the, the whole of the American side of things. Of course, there were indigenous spies that they worked with from our camp. Okay. So their mission, I mean, it was primarily human intelligence gathering. I guess they were running a network of, of local operatives in the area. Is that, is that about right? Well, that's right. Project Gamma was the name of it. And the sole purpose was to run that long range recon, you know, not to engage, but to spy upon the enemy and the troop buildup that was taking place in Cambodia. Okay. Okay. So they were going, they had guys going across the border since you could not, is that correct? That's right. Okay. Got it. Yes. Got it. And how many, how many local sources were they running? Like how big was their network? Well, at the, at the most, at one time, it was about 20. Hmm. Okay. And that was just, was a radio operator and two, and, and Robert and, and Mike. So it was just basically two source handlers and one radio operator, something like that. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Bob Moresco was the man in charge. His rank at the time was captain. And he was the, he was the man. He was the one calling the shots. His radio operator and his case manager were under his supervision. Okay. Okay. I've got it. And you yourself, I guess you said that you were there supporting, so you weren't directly involved in their mission. Like how, how well aware of what they were doing were you? Well, aware enough to know what they were doing, but without being directly involved in, you know, crossing the border. Okay. That was left to the indigenous troops primarily. There were occasional times when, when Bob, would would make an incursion, but it was very rare. Hmm. 
Oh, wow. So and, he went across uh, the border himself a little bit? Yes, oh, wow. Yes, but it was very rare mm-hmm. when he did that. Okay. And we we operated with them in support of anything that they needed. Now, my role there as, you know, having a communications MOS was there were times whenever his radio operator, Scotty, was off-site for one reason or another or just uh, not available. And so Marasco would depend on me to handle the communications and get the info back to the to the right people. Okay, okay. So you got pulled in just by expedient nature, I guess, occasionally, but you weren't really directly supporting their project very much? Well, that's true, okay. yes. I've got you. Did you have to, or did your team have to, like, pull security for him or anything? Like, when Bob went to the border, were you guys out there guarding him or anything like that? Well, when he went to the border, he went across the border. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah I couldn't follow him, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it was a it was a risky job for he and all the other you know soldiers who did that as well. I think Special Forces Project Gamma, I think, was running out of about nine different camps. There were seventy eight camps in Nam, and I think there was about nine different camps who were running cross border operations. Hmm. And uh, yeah, it was it was risky for all of us. Wow. Guys. Okay, so this is just one piece of a, of a big puzzle. Then essentially, it is. Yeah. So one of the things that's confused me, I'd like you to clear it up if you don't mind. You said that these guys were all soldiers; they're all special forces. But I, I've read in a few places that kind of describe them as CIA case officers. It described Morasco as a case officer. So <clears throat> was he a soldier that was cross trained, or was he a like a, a, a civilian that was wearing a uniform, you know, to to blend in or something like that? I mean, can you clear that up for me? Yeah, he was actually military intelligence. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. So you know, he was an army soldier. The special forces and the CIA networked together on a lot of different projects in Nam. <clears throat> and Project Gamma was CIA sanctioned. And although <clears throat> well, there is a military command, the CIA and special forces kind of went around all of that and, and worked directly together. So Morasco did answer to the CIA, but he was not a CIA operative. Okay. okay, I see. Did he receive any training from them? Like, did he go through the farm or any of that stuff that, to your knowledge? To my knowledge, no. Okay, I got you. He was just a man that they, they picked. Okay, I see. So we, we've already mentioned this briefly a couple of times, the double agent. This was, I think his name was Tai Kak Chuyen. Is that correct? Yeah, and Tai Fok Chuen. Chuen. Okay, got it. Chuen. Yeah. Chuen. So, and you said that you knew him a little bit. He was somebody there on the FOB. So, can you talk about him a little bit? What were your interactions with him? Well, it would it would begin at the FOB. We were short on translators, Terps as we called them. So, his handler, who was a Sergeant Alman Smith at the B team, would loan him out to us from time to time. And that's where I first met him at the FOB. We ran some ambush patrols together. Mm, okay, so you're getting out there on patrol yourself. You're not just staying behind and relaying messages then. Oh, no, no, no. Yeah, I ran, conducted lots of ambush patrols. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I know that you were in, in several very, very serious firefights, is what it seemed like from your book. And so at one point, Chien went out there with you, and there were some, I don't know what I would call it, some shenanigans almost, but I guess that he, he started to display some red flags, I guess, while he was out on a mission with you. Is that right? That's true. It wasn't anything we could tie in immediately, but there were several things that happened that uh, around the same time that made us all very kind of suspicious of him. But what you're talking about here is a particular ambush patrol that he and I were on, and there was you know nine other guys with us. They were indigenous South Vietnamese troops. We engaged the enemy as they were coming in across the line. And during the conflict, Chi Win never fired his weapon. I noticed that he wasn't firing it. Later, you know, he said that it had jammed. Well, he should have been able to you know, take care of that real quick. But at the time, I didn't think anything about it because the M16 you know, had been known to jam before, so it wasn't anything new. But it kind of troubled Morasco a little bit because he already had some suspicions about Chuen and he couldn't document certain things about him. And so it was just one of those little tidbits that went along with it. Okay. 
I've got it. And, and just to, to clarify again, when you're out, are you the only American that was on this patrol at this time? Yes, wow. that was standard. That was standard. Yeah. A lot of times we'd go out with two Americans and, and a turf and the team. And But as normal at the FOB, there was just one of us there to go out on patrol. The other one stayed back at the FOB to man the mortar in support. At this time, so, I mean, Terry, you were, you were what, like 20 years old, 19, 20 years old when you were running these missions? Is that right? 19, <laughs> yes. 19 years old. You're the only American on the team out there engaging with the enemy in that's Vietnam right. on the Cambodian border. That's that's incredible. Yeah, what a tremendous responsibility that was. Well, you don't think about it that way when you're doing it. Yeah. <laughs> you I mean, know, was it just daunting it. to leave you know, without any of the other Americans or did it feel just like this is part of the job? It was just part of the job. It's what you did. You know, when, you, when you're trained, it makes all the difference in the world. Sure, sure. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. And I know you've, like you said, you got a lot of excellent training. You had some really good mentors there along the way. But that still blows my mind that a 19 year old is in that position. And not only that, but that you, you know, you pulled it off, you brought your team back, you know, you accomplished the mission and everything. That's that's really something. So, yeah, that's something to always be thankful for. Yeah, 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 no question about it. So did anything else occur besides him not firing his weapon that one time before the the events that kind of came to a head later on? Well, not with me directly. There were other things concerning him. The intel began to dry up a little bit. Some of the other agents were suspicious of him and reported to Mike, that's Marasco's case handler, that they thought that he was a double spy. Actually, some of them said that he was a double spy. Hmm. And so, you know, Mike was compiling these reports and that was lending more credit to the possibility that he was a spy. Okay, I see. So things are starting to build up, but I guess you still need him. Like you still have to go out on missions and still use him as an interpreter. Do you think that he was mistranslating or was he, you know, providing misinformation or anything like that at that time? Or was he just passing stuff to the enemy and, be, you know, and also giving you accurate intelligence? Well, he was passing things to the enemy. I'm, I'm sure of that. As far as intel he was giving us, according to what I've been able to understand, he was giving information to his handler, Sergeant Smith, but the information was always too late to do anything about it. Mm. You know, the, there would be enemy movement through an area, but they'd be gone before you could get there. And so nothing ever happened by it. Okay. Then the, the Viet Cong launched another mortar attack against Makwa, the camp and the village, killed oh, so many people. And, and in this particular case, there was a a uh, young baby that died and, oh, and his mother. Now, this, they weren't the first ones to die, first children to die. But in this particular case, it just kind of hit home to Sergeant Smith. It, and he ordered Chu Wen to target the VC on their next movement. And Chu Wen thus far had failed to provide anything of importance. But according to Sergeant Smith's diaries, he talked to Marasco about this, and they agreed that if the next attack was planned near Makwa, then Smith and his team would take care of it. And if it was from out of our operation near Tan Tree at the border, then Marasco and his team would take care of it. Hmm. That's Smith's side of the story. Marasco denies that conversation ever happened. <laughs> but uh, regardless of that fact, it did happen in our AO. Okay. Okay. I've got you. Yeah. I know that there was some quite a bit of finger pointing that happened later on anyway as well. Yes. Before we go on, I want to let everybody listening know about a new educational tool you're not going to want to miss. It's the Gray Man Briefing Classified. By now, I think I know my listeners pretty well and take it from me. This briefing is exactly the news and educational reference source that you've been looking for. You'll get breaking news updates from all over the world on topics including planned protests and riots, low intensity conflicts, natural disaster alerts, cyber attacks, supply chain disruptions, and more. You'll also get access to articles that help you build your own skills, including urban survival, home security, counter surveillance, escape and evasion techniques, and more. And this is much more than just a newsletter in your inbox. Joining the Gray Man Briefing Classified also includes invitation only channels on the Telegram and Signal apps for convenient real time updates. The newsletter subscription is normally $5 per month, but if you use the code GBC Spycraft, you can save 20% each month for the life of your subscription. I'm already a member myself, and I've been reading and learning a lot since I first subscribed. 
Look it up yourself at graymanbriefing.com. That's gray with an A, graymanbriefing.com. And use the discount code GBC Spycraft to save 20% right from the start. So Terry, at this point, you know, there's there's obviously something something wrong since you're not getting the intel that you need and you're starting to see some concerns about Chuen, but at what point do you get like the the smoking gun? Like how, how do you know that he is the double agent among all of the sources that they're working? Well, one of the Daniel Boone teams, as they were called, working inside of Cambodia, Cambodia discovered some enemy material. And in that material was a photograph of Chu Wen with Viet Cong generals. So when that was brought back, Sergeant Smith identified him, Morasco identified him as the same person. And so that kind of put the wrapping on it. Man, I, it's, it's hard to imagine what must have gone through their minds if they're seeing this photo of their guy arm in arm with a enemy general officer, right? I mean, photographic evidence of that and they all recognize him and everything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm sure that, of course, I wasn't there with him when any of that happened when they confirmed that, but I'm sure that they were quite surprised. Or Smith, anyway. Smith really thought a lot of Chu in, hmm. according to all that I know about it. He considered him a great friend, and so I'm sure that he felt very betrayed. Oh, man. And shocked by it. Morasco, not so much, because he had some suspicions anyway, because there were things about Juin that he couldn't confirm. And, and so he wasn't quite as taken back hmm. by it. Do you think Chuen was a, like a master manipulator or was Sergeant Smith, did he just, you know, fall in love with his source, as they say, or somewhere in between? I think it was a combination of both. Chuen obviously had to be a great manipulator to do what he did. There's even speculation that he was a triple agent. You know, really? also providing, yeah, yeah, to, you know, providing, working for us, working for the South Vietnamese government and working for the North Vietnamese. Oh my gosh. So, so he had to be pretty clever, you know, and, and manipulative that way. Sergeant Smith, I think, though, was taken in by the friendship. Hmm. And of course, that's what a covert operative wants to do anyway. He wants to make you his friend, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it's there's. Sure. I'm sure it's very difficult to strike the perfect balance between you know bonding with someone that you need to do something dangerous for you and keeping them enough at arm's length. If it turns out they're going to betray you in the end, and that's I'm sure that's an incredibly hard balance to strike. Yeah, and a tragic mistake if you fall into. Yep, it. yep, and it's it's happened many times over the years. Certainly, very unfortunate. So, what did they? Did they have any opinions on why he was doing this? Was he just like getting paid by all both groups or all three groups? Or did he hate, you know, American intervention in Vietnam or, or some other reason that you're aware of? Well, I don't know what their conclusions were. You know, I only have my own opinions about it. He still had family in, in the North. He and his parents had come to the South when he was like 16 years old. And I think now at this time he was about 31. And but he still had brothers in North Vietnam. I know one of them served was serving in a North Vietnamese defense group. And so I know he had some feelings for that. He had to have that's his family. You know, he loves them. So there were some sympathies there. But I'm not so sure that he was politically motivated because the man's salary, as best as I can determine, was about two thousand dollars a month. Now, Compare that to my salary of what five hundred dollars a wow, month. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was... you know, he's doing very well financially. There. Yeah, yeah, that's that's very good pay for that era, and and probably goes sure. a lot farther in his hometown than it would back in the states oh, for you. Oh, exactly, exactly. And, and remember, this is nineteen sixty nine. Yeah. So oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. I could use and, two thousand uh, a month right now, honestly. Well, yeah, right now yeah. would be good. Though. So that, if you multiply that times two or even three, I mean, you're doing very well. Right. right. So it could have just been money. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, why just get you know one single source of income when you can do two or three? Sure. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that that makes sense. But he, I mean, he's obviously playing an incredibly dangerous game there if he was he was he was but he got caught yep so what happened I'm, at, at this point i'm assuming that chuen has no idea that his photo has been uncovered so what what happened once they had that photo and they knew who their man was well initially marasco had sergeant smith and chuen basically pretty much taken out of everything 
and uh, Chi Wen had gone back to Saigon, which is now today Ho Chi Minh City. He was at home with his family. So a plan was designed to call him back in on the pretext of a special mission. Mm. The goal was to get him back into Makwa. And then once he arrived for that, then they arrested him there. Okay. Is this just Marasco and, and Smith at this point, or are there others involved? No, there are others involved. And I don't know those gentlemen. I didn't have any connection with them, but there were those in the project, you know, over even Marasco that were involved in it. Okay. And they were responsible for the general operation. Gotcha. So everyone within Gamma, not so much with, within your, your FOB, they're your A-team or anything then was... Right. No, our, our A-team had absolutely nothing to do with the arrest. It has been reported by some Vietnamese bloggers that the ambush we talked about earlier where he didn't fire his mm -hmm. weapon played a part in his arrest. But really, that's not true. That's just a perception someone has. That wasn't enough to arrest anyone on, you know. It might be a small consideration in things, but didn't have anything to do with it. So no, none of us had anything to do with the arrest. Okay. Okay. I see. And I, I take it that you didn't know any of this until after the fact, like you weren't aware of any planning or any of that either at the time. We were not. We were not privileged to know that at the moment. So what do they do with him once they've actually got him? Well, they began an interrogation, which lasted for 10 days, and they drugged him and interrogated him. There was nothing really concrete that came out of it that I'm aware of, except to it's reported that UN became very angry and and told them that Americans are stupid and that they're going to lose the war. But I don't know of any additional information that was actually gained from him. Mm. Okay, so they didn't elicit a confession from him of guilt or anything like that? Not that I'm aware of. Okay. I mean, they did have the photo and they recognize it and all that. It doesn't sound like there's much doubt at that point. So, oh, um, yeah. like, yeah. you know, like, like we mentioned, I mean, he, he was killed. How did they decide to kill him rather than jail him or release him or, you know, double him back again or anything like that. Any, any idea on that? Yeah, the, uh, we should be clear to, I know some people will say, why didn't they just send the man to jail? Well, that's not that feasible there. You know, the, the South Vietnamese government was ripe with spies and Chu In being a double agent had access to a lot of information. And they didn't want to take the risk of him being released or aided to escape. And so that's why they made a decision to go ahead and eliminate him. Okay. And that came about when they didn't know what to do with him. But Morasco and a couple of them went to Saigon to meet with the CIA operatives that they were accountable to and discuss the situation with them. And Morasco and others report that they had instructions to eliminate the man. And so they came back and made plans to do that. The plan was, and they executed it this way, but they took him in a boat, took him out into the South China Sea, shot him in the head and dumped his body into the sea. Hmm. The next day, a fax comes in from the CIA saying that, you know, don't kill the man. But yet it had already happened. So that posed a major problem. Hmm. What do you, what do you think about the timing of all that? Like, it sounds like a verbal go ahead, followed by a written denial, you know, a day later. I mean, what do you think about that? Yeah. Well, you know, the CIA is very good about covering itself. Every government agency is, but there could have been some speculation that this might turn out well. So they decided to reverse it, or it could have been that the operatives that gave the go ahead shared it with their upper authority and they told them, no, mm. we don't know really what happened right. there. Actually, nobody does. Right. It's just that that fact showed up after giving the green light, it was executed and then they were told not to do it too late. Yeah. Yeah. I see. Yeah. Mid-level guy could have gotten overruled by a higher level guy or something. That's also very funny. Uh, Exactly. Could have. We don't know. I don't know anyway. <laughs> yeah. Some, somebody knows somewhere, but anyway. yeah. Okay. So at this point, I mean, he, he's dead. It sounds like his body is not recoverable and why this doesn't go away though. Right. I mean, this, this blows up into a pretty significant event. So what, 
what was the catalyst for this information getting out into the public from a very, very secretive program and just a very few people that know what happened? Well, that falls back on the shoulders of Sergeant Smith, the UN's handler. He became paranoid. He had objected to the assassination in the first place. And once it happened, he felt like, for whatever reason, that Morasco and the other soldiers were planning to execute him as well. And over a period of a couple of weeks, he just got worse and worse about it, and he decided to report it. So he did. And that's what exposed it, brought it to the attention of authorities. Hmm. That's that's such a, a strange twist to me. And I've tried to kind of wrap my head around a bit. Do you think that he was suffering from paranoia or do you think that there were some hints being dropped that he needed to keep his mouth shut or what? I mean, like I know that, you know, most people have heard of the concept of fragging, you know, from Vietnam where sure. unpopular people were maybe being killed by their own fellow unit members and that sort of thing. So was it a, what was it possible at all that he might be the next guy you think, or was this like a paranoid delusion of his? Well, I believe it's paranoia, but and for two reasons, uh, knowing Morasco personally, he, he just he's just not that kind of guy. <laughs> you know, I just didn't believe that personally. But in their defense, investigators looked at all of that and they could find zero evidence, nothing at all that would indicate there had been any plan to assassinate or intimidate Smith. So it kind of falls back on Smith. Hmm. So it's it's seemingly a concern that spun out of nowhere, like he was just like getting worked up. I mean, he must be feeling a lot of emotions, you know, with his local friend turns out to be a double and that guy disappears and a lot, a lot going on, a lot of stress on top of normal, you know, combat deployment stress and that sort of thing. So I can understand, you know, a little bit of his, what's the word, his emotional state, I guess I would say, but yeah. it seems like for him to work with these guys so closely and then accuse them of plotting his murder, it sounds like he took a, had a mental break. Or, or something like that? I mean, do you think he was okay in the head after that? I mean, how did everybody react to these accusations? Well, they weren't very happy about it, of course. <laughs> uh, but, you know, when, when charges were filed, uh, they weren't filed against Smith directly, but they were going to hold him as a witness. He claimed in his diaries that he would not have testified against the men. So we don't know for sure. Hmm. So who, who did, did he make these claims to anyway? Did he go to military police or his chain of command in special forces or, or what? Yeah, I don't know who he first contacted. I know he did talk to the CIA. Hmm. Uh, and, and of course, word got up to General Abrams, who was commander of the armed forces in Vietnam. General Abrams did not like special forces operations because special forces operated independently of him. So, yeah. When it got to the top man and he went to the commander of special forces, Robert Rowe, and he wanted an explanation about this. And Rowe had made up a cover story to protect Moresco and the, the two men who killed him by saying that Jiwen had been sent off, you know, on a covert mission and they hadn't heard from hmm. him. If Smith hadn't have come forward, that would have been the end of the story. Having heard that he was assassinated, then General Abrams you know, filed charges against Roe, Moresco, and the other men. Wow. Okay. So were they all arrested? Like, did they all go into a, you know, the brig at this point, or was it? Yeah. Yeah. They were placed under arrest. <laughs> yes. And charged, charged with premeditated murder. And this is Colonel Roe and Morisco. And how, how many people? Was it like six or seven guys? I think? Oh, let's see. There was, let me think about that. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like there was seven, I think. Okay. Yeah. And they were all on the planning of it. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't down to our level on the A-team. This was in the confines of the Project gotcha. Gamma organization. So were you still in country when all this was going on? I was. Now, Mike, the case manager, gave me a bit of a warning about what was going on. He told me that something really big was coming down. And he said, I can't tell you the details. He said, I just want you to know that it's coming. And I said, well, okay. I mean, what do you do with yeah, that? That's right? honest, certainly. Yeah. yeah, I had been up to the FOB then for a few days, and I came back 
Morasco, Mike, and Scotty were gone. They had been pulled off the team. They were summoned back into Mokwa, and from there, you know, they were arrested. Okay. Okay. Were you ever right. interviewed by anyone? I was, yes, but only as I was leaving country a month later. Hmm. I had to go through Terry debriefing, and they asked me specific questions about the operations that we had there. Did I know anything about any covert operations into Cambodia and that sort of thing? Mm-hmm. And no, I did not. <laughs> <laughs> of course not. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, well, there's. Yeah, I, w- I was under orders, even. I mean, a common sense will tell you, you know, that you don't want to get involved in that. But I was under orders to, to say what I said. And I was under orders not to talk about it when I got home. Yeah. So when I left the country, I didn't really know what the status of everybody was. Then all of a sudden, being stateside, I see Robert Morasco on television being held, you know, in jail. Uh, oh, my Lord. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah. I can imagine that was a shock to have Vietnam it follow was. you back home in, in a way. Yeah. So I just looking at this from the perspective oh. of the investigators, this has got to be an incredibly tough thing to get to the bottom of because so much of the, the background and everything that led up to it is necessarily classified and, and maybe beyond beyond their reach. I would imagine. Do you think that's correct? Yeah, pretty much. Now, you know, the charges against them for murder, which I think personally was ridiculous. I mean, you're at war and you're supposed to kill the enemy. And if you kill the enemy any number of ways, you know, you're doing your job. And even an ambush patrol, you surprise and kill the enemy. So when they charged them with murder, I was really, you know, kind of shocked by that. Right. And as well as most everybody else. Yeah. That was kind of public sentiment as well at that time, right? Like we're prosecuting guys for identifying and killing yes. the enemy during war. Exactly. Exactly. And it's not the first time it's ever happened and it's happened since, believe it or not. But, but yeah, it was, it was really unusual, I thought, and, and wrong. The charges against them maybe would have held up if it had gone to trial, but There were some sharp lawyers that got involved. I know one of them today, John Stevens Berry, Hmm. but they got involved. And ultimately the bottom line was, look, if you're going to charge these men with murder, then, you know, we're going to petition certain documents. And this is going to expose a lot of things that the military doesn't want exposed. And that played a big part in the decision not to pursue charges. But it's also said that, Richard Nixon, the president, got involved. The CIA refused to testify. So charges were dropped, which left this, those guys in a, in a bad place. You know, their reputation, reputations are, are stained. They're not cleared of any charges. They're just dropped. Hmm. Wow. So they're, so what, what happened to them afterwards? I mean, did they stay in uniform for a while longer or just kind of, you know, go to the four winds? Well, Robert Rowe, the commander of Special Forces, resigned his commission. He he knew that it was over. He could never make it to the rank of general then. Mm-hmm. And so he just resigned his commission and, and, and left the military. Bob Moresco followed suit with that. He was very disenchanted with how they had been treated. He couldn't stay in the Army any longer, so he resigned. Other soldiers were just reassigned. Okay. Okay, I've got it. How long did this play out? Was this a month long thing or like a year or two? I mean, it seems like it could have dragged out quite a ways. Oh, just a few months, actually. Chewin was executed in June. And let's see, it came to light, I think, in September. And by the end of October, the charges had been dropped. Oh, okay. Okay. So yeah, that was that's faster than I anticipated. So I have to ask, are you are you personally convinced that they were correct that they had the right guy, that that was Chu Win in the photo. I mean, you said that he didn't admit to anything later on, and there's some circumstantial evidence there, but I mean, did they did they definitely kill a guy who was working for the enemy, in your opinion? In my, in my opinion, yes. Okay, yeah, I mean, that's what I think as well, but it, it's always a, you know, there's a, well, a little... Yeah, there, doubt there's, there's, always, there's always a doubt, and there are some historians and authors who question that. But in having, you know, worked with you in and all the different things that went on, it, it appears so, yes. Right, right. So what happened 
after all this is over with, what happened to Sergeant Smith? Because it seems like he would be a, a real pariah, you know, in the community after something like this, I would imagine. Well, I don't know his immediate disposition, you know, what he did immediately, how much longer he stayed in the military, but I know that he eventually retired, became an insurance salesman or something. Hmm. Okay. Yeah. Very different life there. Did he, yeah, sure. do I remember correctly, he wrote a book or maybe his widow wrote a book or something like that? If so, I haven't read it. Yes. And I, and I know her, we have talked and spent some time okay. together. You know, I've, I've even visited with her. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. So she published his memoirs. That's where I have some insight into his thinking about things. Okay. Okay. Any, any thoughts on what his perspective on it all was? Like, did he live the rest of his life thinking that, you know, they, they should not have killed Chuan and that maybe they were going to come to him next, or did he have a change of heart later on or anything like that? Well, it's hard to speak for a dead man. Right. But right. Certainly. Yeah. I, I would think that he, he probably, you know, held on to that position that it shouldn't have happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Have do you have you kept up with anybody else? It sounds like you've kept in touch with a lot of people from years back gone by. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, of course, I was in touch with Bob Moresco, you know, for a long time. Today, there's Albert Kittredge. He was our camp commander. Robert Brucker, uh, Phil Johnson, Will Williams. These are all team members. We're still oh, in wow. touch. Okay. There's others that I really appreciate that have passed on. You know, Eddie Hamby, Nat Fredia, special guys to me. Yeah, I remember some of those names. They're coming back to me now from your book as well. Yeah. Has Moresco passed away now? I mean, did he, what did he go on to? Yes. That? Yes. Yeah. He passed away a few years ago. Did he stay in some sort of intelligence work to your knowledge after that? No, he became an insurance salesman. <laughs> wow. wow. <laughs> yeah. He made a run for some political office in his hometown. I don't know what it was for mayor, councilman or something, but that didn't work out for him. Mm. So I think he spent the rest of his his life uh, in the insurance service okay. until he retired from that. And how about you? After you left the service, do you go into insurance as well? <laughs> well, not initially, but some, oh, yes. Really? Oh, I, did, wow. uh, I did a variety of things, different jobs that I worked my way through several years with. And that includes some of the insurance sales. That included construction work. And, and sales. So today I'm, I'm a CEO, president of a, a nonprofit missionary agency. Oh, okay. Okay. Fantastic. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, we uh, focus our, our attention to the Middle East, Israel and, and Palestine, the Jews and the Palestinians. We proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ as, as we believe it so to that nation. And we encourage reconciliation of man to God and man to man through Jesus Christ, which we believe is the format for the peace in that area. Mm. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You've, it sounds like you've got your work cut out for you in that area, certainly. Oh, it's an interesting experience. I believe yes. it. I believe it. So this is, Terry, this has been incredibly interesting. This is honestly an, such an amazing story to me, and I'm, I'm glad to hear it from you firsthand, finally, because I've read quite a bit about it in the past. Is there anywhere, we've already talked about your book, the book is The Youngest Green Beret. I got it off of Amazon and anybody else can pick it up as well. It's kind of a short read. I, I finished it in about a day, day and a half. So if you want to read a lot more about this from Terry yourself, you can pick up his book, The Youngest Green Beret. Terry, is there anywhere that people can connect with you if they want to learn more? I mean, do you talk about this online still to this day? Well, I can and I will. If anyone wants to know if more information about it, they can contact me by email at terry at usajourney.us. Oh, wow. You might get a lot of emails. I think a lot of people are going to listen to this episode, Terry. So get ready for it. <laughs> okay. Well, wonderful. I'll try, to I'll try to respond. All right. I appreciate it. Thank you. This has been really informative, Terry. I really appreciate you taking the time to talk to me about this today. Well, thank you, Justin, for having me on. All right. Take care. If you're interested in more of Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 and at cold.war.stamps or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. That includes free PDF copies of my own book, Spy Shots Volume 1, 101 True Tales from the World of Espionage, and my second book, Covert Arms, Weapons from the World of Spycraft and Espionage. I want to say a big thank you to all of my patrons, including Matthew C. and Victor L. 
With your support, I've been able to continue funding my research and publication across multiple platforms to date. You can also find more great articles on my website, spycraft101.com. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll stick around because there's lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.